Welcome back to another Moment of Tiki, here in the Lagoon of Mystery, my home tiki bar in Central Texas. One thing I wanted to talk about today is a phrase that I've heard uh, multiple times over the years. <clears throat> Essentially, uh, someone says, authenticity in tiki doesn't matter because tiki isn't real. It's made up. It's completely made up. Uh, in my opinion, that's a bunch of bull. <laughs> tiki as a whole is made up, but it's not made up from whole cloth. It is instead cobbled together from elements taken from a wide array of cultures, uh, be it from the various Caribbean islands. Yes, Caribbean is tiki, no matter what uh, people may say, uh, and primarily from Polynesian cultures. Uh, Tiki beg, borrows, and steals from all of these cultures to create the mythological tiki culture that we are aware of uh, and enjoy today. <clears throat> In my opinion, it's important to learn about these cultures that tiki borrows from. Uh, not only does it make you a more worldly, more knowledgeable, more well-rounded person, it also gives you insight into the culture so you do not inadvertently uh, cause offense. And that's the last thing anyone in Tiki really wants to do. Uh, goodness knows there's enough controversy in the world uh, as it is right now. So that is why whenever I have an opportunity, I like to explore different cultures and learn about them. Case in point, today's book, the Statues That Walk by Terry Hunt and Carl Lippo. This is a fascinating study uh, on the history of Rapa Nui, which uh, in popular culture is known as Easter Island. It was given the name Easter Island by Europeans when it was first sighted in 1722 by Dutch explorers in the Pacific. Rapa Nui is quite possibly the remotest human habitation on Earth. It is so far away from any other island, any continents, anything else. Uh, the Polynesian explorers that landed there around the year 1200 arrived to find a volcanic island that was completely covered in palm forest, uh, a veritable uh, garden tropical paradise. Within a dozen years or so, of European contact, um, the story had begun and been repeated for hundreds of years afterwards that the great society that grew up on Rapa Nui, the one that created the giant Moai statues and spread them all across a relatively small island, um, had fallen victim to its own vanity that the forest was clear-cut uh, to aid the construction of these statues, that uh, without the forest, ecological catastrophe happened and all the topsoil was no longer held in place and was eroded away. As food resources became more and more scarce, the island broke out into tribal warfare and a population of more than 3,000 slaughtered itself until there were only a few hundred remain, remaining. This, through most of the 20th century, was held up as an example of ecological catastrophe brought on by human ignorance and arrogance. Um, Hunt and Lippo are trained anthropologists, archaeologists, and they went to Rapa Nui to study the culture and the history of the culture, to gain insights. They did not set out to rewrite the history books. <clears throat> what they found when they started looking was amazing. And this book, it, it really thoroughly documents it. Um, far from a man-made ecological catastrophe born out of arrogance and empire building, uh, Hunt and Lippo lay out a very convincing case that it wasn't 
the Polynesian settlers to Rapa Nui that destroyed the forest. Although there is evidence that there was some contribution because uh, there was a forest clearing for agricultural uses, but rather it was the Polynesian rat that stowed away on their ships as they arrived that spread out into the Rapa Nui ecosystem devoid of any type of predators and feasted upon the seeds of these palm trees and multiplied at an exponential rate uh, to the point where the trees couldn't reproduce. If a seed did happen to avoid the rat's initial appetite, then the tender young seedling that sprouted up was devoured by rats as well. Uh, within 200 years, 200 years, rats an invasive species had wiped out the entire forest on Rapa Nui. That is astounding. Uh, tremendous, tremendous ecological upheaval that humans did have uh, a hand in inadvertently by introducing the rats, but not directly. Uh, a second fallacy was that because of the loss of the forest, the land was rendered infertile. It turns out from a geological and historical perspective that Rapa Nui was never terribly fertile in the first place. Uh, it's a relatively young volcanic island, uh, but it is not very big. Uh, the, the highest peak on the island is barely over a thousand feet tall, so it's not high enough to catch uh, the clouds to cause precipitation and rain, so rainfall on the island is quite erratic. Uh, there aren't deep valleys. There is not the topography to lend itself to developing a dense biomatter soil. So the soil on Rapa Nui is now and has, has always been very poor. When European explorers arrived there, they, they were kind of surprised that there weren't the great um, terraced farms that you would see in a lot of the other Polynesian uh, islands that they had visited. Uh, instead, and, and this was taken as evidence that the Rapa Nui were primitive and lacked uh, um, sophistication in their farming techniques. Contrary to this notion, um, the Rapa Nui actually adapted to the poor soil conditions uh, with some stone-walled gardening to protect uh, certain plants from the desiccating winds from the sea and the salt spray from the sea. And also the poor soil they cultivated using a technique called lithic mulching. Um, lithic mulching essentially means you're taking large rocks and crushing them into tiny small rocks so that the minerals within those rocks are more readily leached into the soil, nourishing the plants and giving the plants access to a lot of these trace minerals that would not normally be available to them. Uh, anthropologists covered the island and found billions of fist-sized rocks all over the island where they could not have reached had humans not intervened and taken these rocks there. So rather than uh, the human population wasting away because they couldn't grow uh, crops because of the ecological catastrophe, the Rapa Nui instead were very sophisticated uh, farmers, agricultural people, drawing forth more productivity from the land that was ill-suited for it, uh, which is really amazing when you think about it. This brings us to the biggest um, claims perpetuated over the past hundred years about uh, the population of Rapa Nui. After the so-called ecological collapse, the story went, the reasoning went, that the great empire that had built the giant Moai uh, fell into warfare against itself over the scarce resources of the island to prevent starvation. Uh, turns out that there is very little evidence in the archaeological historical record uh, for violence on the island of Rapa Nui. 
There is some indication of individuals being injured, but very few life-threatening injuries. Certainly there is no evidence of large-scale warfare among the population, and even the earliest European explorers to visit the island commented on their relative lack of weapons. In fact, uh, that first visit uh, by the Dutch in 1722 resulted in the Rapa Nui becoming so excited about the Dutch explorers' elaborate hats and other vestments that they were wearing that a near riot broke out, so Europeans doing what Europeans almost always do when they encounter uh, isolated tribes, uh, promptly killed about a dozen of the Rapa Nui, which sent them panicking back into the uh, remnants of their palm forests, and the Dutch sailed away. Uh, 1744, just a short time later, Captain James Cook arrived at Rapa Nui, hoping to resupply his ships. He found a very poor culture, um, uh, very, very, very poor in resources, and commented about this. Uh, stayed for only a couple of days before passing on on his journey. A um, few years after that, a French uh, fleet showed up and noted some of the same things. During this time, sailors from these ships departed to the islands of Rapa Nui and quickly found out that the natives would trade almost anything for their hats and brooches and various things that they had from Europe, you know, glass beads, the typical list of suspects. Uh, in fact, uh, the natives would trade sexual favors. If you have any knowledge of the history of European exploration. When sailors go to other parts of the world, they carry the traditional venereal diseases, the sexually transmitted diseases of Europe with them. Uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, after well establishing themselves in the New World, syphilis was added to the mix. All of these were brought to Rapa Nui, and for the next hundred years, there was very little contact with the Rapa Nui Island. When the next European settlers showed up, um, they discovered that an island that had once supported 3,000 or so natives uh, was now reduced to a population of four or 500. Um, this wasn't because of intertribal warfare. This was because the scourge of disease wiped out this massive population that had no innate defense of it. it, it it's just astounding. Um, in the 1860s, Peruvian slave traders raided the islands, uh, which had begun to rebuild from its low population, but captured more than a thousand islanders and took them to Peru to be indentured servants. Uh, oftentimes they got the illiterate islanders to just make a mark on a contract saying, yes, I will be your slave. And this was counted as legal. Um, make a long story short, uh, outside forces intervened and forced Peru to repatriate the surviving Rapa Nui Islanders, along with other Polynesians who had been uh, kidnapped from other islands in the South Pacific. Unfortunately, as they were being shipped out, they were exposed to smallpox. And again, if you have any familiar with the Americas, the same thing happened with the Polynesians, including Rapa Nui, and smallpox decimated the survivors as well. By 1877, only 111 native Rapa Nui survived on the island, from a population of 3,200 years before to 111. That was spectacular genocide. This culture that carved out by hand these giant Moai statues in honor of their chiefs and their great leaders and their families and placed them all around the island in spectacular shows of, of 
personal wealth and family prestige had been exterminated to a mere fraction of what they had once become. This uh, population that had carved out a successful civilization on an island that was spectacularly unsuited to supporting human life at all in any, any conceivable notion. Uh, poor volcanic soil, erratic rain, isolation, no trees. Yet they had survived all of that and built a thriving society only to have it wiped out by contact with Europeans. Stop me if you've heard this story before. This is a really profoundly impressive book. Uh, I want to warn you that it is not, uh, how do I say it, particularly easy read. It's not really difficult, but these are academics. Um, they don't resort to jargon a lot. I've read plenty of academic papers in my time and it can be really dense. This is written specifically for general public, but they do get technical at times. Uh, so it's not uh, like a page turner uh, dramatic history, but it is a fascinating work, a fascinating book. And it's really telling during their interactions with some of the natives because even then, even with all the archaeologists and anthropologists know and all the knowledge that has been lost to the descendants of the Rapa Nui over time, there are still insights that the natives on the island are able to give the researchers that wasn't found in textbooks or research papers or anything else like that. So I, I think that's a, a fitting tribute right there. Um, in closing, I really rec recommend this book, The Statues That Walked, is a fascinating history of Easter Island slash Rapa Nui and the people that live there. And if you ever hope to visit or have even a curiosity about the history of the Moai, it's, it's really an eye-opening account of what people are capable uh, in the best sense of that phrase and what people are capable of in the worst sense of that phrase. And The Statues That Walked is a cautionary tale for the ages that more people should know about, especially people who profess love for Tiki. Until next time in the Lagoon of Mystery, aloha. Aloha.